waiting for Patrick to turn this on. Perfect. So, in honor of Ann Perry's birthday, which we are not assigning a number, the first thing I'm going to do is give you a birthday card from our staff. Oh, thank you very much. You are very welcome. And the second thing we're doing is that we have a birthday cake for you, oh my which we are cutting up, in which Patrick is... The other Patrick, you have to be named Patrick or John to work here. You want me to stick it in your bag? Can you reach it? Perfect. Okay. So anyway, we're going to serve you cake. And if you get it on your book, that's your own risk, right? Or you can put it aside until, pardon me, we are through with our conversation here and move to the book signing. So this is really exciting. You know, we've been doing this together now for nearly 30 years. Oh, Lord, it's been a really long time. I'm only, I'm only a little bit younger than Anne, but, but we both feel as though we're actually just 50. Well, I've just, I had such a great October altogether that I've sort of knocked off 20 years. I sent a friend a card to a friend of mine who's just a little bit younger than I am, and she makes quite a joke about that. I, I wear makeup and she doesn't very often. But this card said, take makeup from, from a, 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 a makeup artist of class or something like that. And inside it says, make up your age, make up your weight. <laughs> 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 very good idea. I'll make it up. Yes, I've just turned 50. So I'd like you to know that our twin dressing is a total accident, and she, she really cracked up when I picked her up at the hotel since we both seem to be what I'm thinking of as a rich burgundy or possibly verging towards the royal purple or something so maybe that's also indicative of our age and the season because we're heading towards Christmas. This is new, I've never had it, never worn it before. Well it's actually a very good color. Thank you, it was a good choice especially for tonight but I, I can't believe it. <laughs> well these things happen. Yeah, so I've let's talk. I've never seen you in that color either and I've never <laughs> right, I decided to do the whole thing, even my shoes. Is that exotic? Right. I know, it's sort of a Barbie thing. <laughs> I'm too older to have Barbie dolls when I was young, you know, so sometimes you just have to take this stuff on when you get to a bigger age. So, um, how long have you been doing these lovely Christmas novellas? I've lost track. I, oh, look at oh, that. Thank you, thank you very PK. Much. Uh, it must be about 17 years Thank or 18 you. because I think I've just finished writing the 18th one. Okay. So it, it's a roundabout there. I think it's a lovely gift for your fans, you know, that you do these lovely books. And also it gives you a chance to explore some of your characters, maybe not always the lead characters. No, it, it's almost always not the lead. Right. It's somebody that I've liked but didn't really have room to expand on because it's... If it's self-indulgent, your editor's going to cut it out anyway. Um, and I enjoy them. And it's Christmas that gives you an excuse to have a really happy ending. Every, right. Every Good one, point. Yes, every one of them, I think, ends with the churning bells on hmm. Christmas, as Christmas Eve turns into Christmas. Uh, so it's almost like a ticking clock, so whatever happens in the yes, book has it, to end. It has to end right then. And then when you realize that it all come out right, you hear the church. And in England, you can hear the church bells everywhere in the country because they ring out because you more or less hear them from one village to the next. Yeah, ever since I read The Nine Tailors by Dorothy Sayers, yes. I have wished that I could just once do a whole bell ringing mm -hmm. thing. Have any of you read that book? Okay, so you know what I mean? It's, it's yes. an art form. More than right? once. Right, exactly. It's actually not her best plotted book, but you have to love the countryside and the bells. I love the countryside, the bells, the language, and I just discovered Deborah Crombie. Oh my God! Have been taking you all this time? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, I read one because I knew it was doing well, and I thought I, I would enjoy it, might learn something. And I've been out and bought a little more since then. Very good. She toured around much of the countryside. But she's been more London centric recently. But she, I mean, I am English. I am a Londoner. And I've got a reasonably good ear for works, what works and what doesn't. And she's never put a foot wrong that I can hear. That's exciting. Yeah. Yes, I'm very fond of Deborah's mm -hmm. books. So any of you taking notes? Deborah Crombie, C-R-O-M-B-E. Mm -hmm. 
D.I.E. if you have not read her, but they are contemporary there. Oh, yes, um, but it, it's still the London that I was born in. Mind talking about London that I was born in, I read one of Jackie Winspear's very recent ones about the outbreak of World War II, mm -hmm. and I realized that it was the area that I know and the time when I was about 10 months old, and it must have been my mother's generation, <coughs> and we actually, it was about Belgian refugees. Mm. My father's sister married a Belgian. Really? So we, you know, it, it was so familiar. It was strange and, and exhilarating and sad and beautiful, beautifully done. About one of the artifacts of age is that your life turns into history. Uh -huh. you know, <laughs> some of you, some of you may not be there yet, but it does, and then it feels like really, that. yeah, very, very bizarre. Anyway, who are the characters and what's going on in this lovely new fellow that we are dealing with tonight? Oh, one, one of my favorite characters. When Scruff grew up, a, a little bit, I had to get a new little, little boy. Well, oh, this is in the William Monk series, yes, then, right? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I expect you to be quite all right. Um, so often when I would rather people couldn't, it's in my face, but, um, you know, what I was thinking is what was in my face. He's a little, um, little urchin. Right. And he's, he's, he's not quite like Scuff, but he has the same urchin's instinct. And uh, he's taken in, not by Hester, but by the, by Claudine Burroughs, who works in the clinic. Okay. In the clinic for prostitutes. And uh, he finds a home there. And he doesn't really know what his real name is, but he's called Worm, and that works for him. <laughs> and he sees this young woman down on the dockside, and to him she's absolutely beautiful, and the sunlight falls on her hair in a moment of breaking the clouds, and it's like a halo for him. And he can see that she's in trouble, and there are two men after her, and they get hold of her, and they take her away. And he follows, thinking, I've got to do something. And he, he feels he's got to rescue this beautiful woman. And uh, he... he sees where she goes, and then he goes back, and he, there's nothing he can do. And he tells Squeaky about it, Squeaky Robinson, you know, the fearsome, used to be a brothel keeper, is now reformed much against his will, and he's almost respectable, if ever they were. <laughs> That's a pretty horrible epithet yes, for exactly. a London crook. <laughs> exactly. But he, he kind of enjoys it. No. And he's, he and Claudine had a running battle to begin with, but there's a mutual respect now. But anyway, he he's awfully fond of this little kid who's about that size. And, and uh, he would die before he'd admit it. But he and Worm work together to rescue this young woman. And she's not in half as much trouble as they think she is. She's a good deal sharper than they think she is. But it, it ends with a, a wonderful fire, and I mean a fire like house on fire, several houses with the horse-drawn um, fire and all the rest of it. And they have the best Christmas they've ever had. They have geese and they have presents and they have scarlet ribbons and bells and it all ends up happening. Oh, wow. Well, what a happy time. I know. Well, it's very Dickensian in this yes, way. Yes. And a Worm finds the most beautiful gift he can for Claudine. Oh. Well, she's kind of very fond of it. Yeah. And I think he instinctively knows that. And he even... And the first thought when she undoes this beautiful silk skirt, what did you do to get hold of this? Because he was a pickpocket, actually. Mm. I, I, wor I worked. I earned it. Honestly. Honestly, I did. Doing what? I don't know. <laughs> but he earned it. And he, he, he gave it to me. She's like, opening, opening, opening. You like it? Yes, it's a bit simple. No, it sounds absolutely lovely. And it ties into Dark Tide Rising, which is the book that came out in September. You're also here signing the William Monk. Oh, yes. yes. Right, you forgot about it, didn't you? Because yes. you're so busy writing something else. I always love that. Anne always says this during the headlights. Look when I say this, because she's like two books up. I have started a new spell of life. I've had a birthday, I've turned a big corner, and I've got two new series. Oh. Oh. Daniel, you may have mm -hmm. met. And I'm, I put down the pen to, to come here. I don't mean at, at home, I mean just from the hotel. Uh, and that's the third, the third one, which is going to be called Dig Two Graves, unless they haven't changed it. Maybe it's a two-hour And uh, I won't tell you what it's about, but it's um, 
Well, it's a new character and one very, very dangerous person who's going to be a lifetime enemy to Daniel. Oh. Mm-hmm. Dangerous. Mm-hmm. He's a very, very pompous, opinionated, oh. self-satisfied uh, forensic expert. <laughs> Not unlike Sabrina Stilbury. And the other, uh, the other is much more exciting to me because it hasn't come out yet and I've been planning this for about five years. It's a thriller set in uh, Europe in the 19, 1933. It starts out in, in actually it starts out in Nazi <coughs> and then goes to Berlin. And we get another point of view which is in, in Britain. And 1933 is the year Hitler came to power for anybody who's not a bunch of the 30s. And the fashions are gorgeous and the music is lovely. <laughs> It's a very dark and very dangerous time. Uh, right in the middle of that, historically, occurs, it all takes place in about two weeks or less. Historically, is the book burning in Berlin. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that. Mm-hmm. I know there was one in Munich. I wasn't aware if there was a big one in Berlin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in, in the place between the opera house and the library. Mm-hmm. Good place to burn books. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I can see that you're going to be engaged in the 1930s. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a friend of mine, I don't really know her very well, but she's also a friend of my agent there, and I think this is how she got the, the skinny on this one. She gave me for my birthday, and I really don't know her very well, a beautiful coffee table book about that thick and big size of pictures of 1930s fashion. Mm. Oh. <laughs> I mean, could anything be more perfect? Oh, that's lovely. They really were gorgeous clothes. Oh, it's so yeah. feminine, so flattery. Yeah, all that set. It's very hard to wear. Every line yes, is revealed. Uh, you know, yes, so. a cat on the cross. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, but I don't have to wear it. I just have to dream about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why Wallace Simpson was able to get away with it. She was built like a stick. You know, yes, so. she really was. Yeah, yeah. but those fashions were very, very good. Well, there, was, there were suggestions that she had problems. Well, I wasn't even going to bed. <laughs> yes, they, they were both. Um, yes. yes. Uh, Women are not supposed to be built like sticks. No. That's true. true. But, um, she knew how to wear it with, with assurance. And I think a lot of looking good is, is the belief that you do. Oh, I think that's also true. She also had the benefit of incredible jewelry, which you oh, know, yes. can, can yes. make any fashion look better. Okay, so Dark Tide Rising. Let's go back to William Monk um, because he's just such a great character. Seems to me the year before when we were talking about William Monk, it had to do with the Hungarian community yes, it in London. And it was a really interesting look, you know, at, at immigration um, in an earlier time and how difficult it was for a community of immigrants um, in a place, um, well, in London yeah. um, to survive. It was, and they, they stuck to each other fairly naturally. You want, to, you want somebody who likes the same food you do, who speaks the same language, who has the same more or less religion, and understands without explanations what you mean. Mm-hmm. And Hungarian's not easily transparent no. to other people. So yeah. she was an immigrant, as most of the American friends, but that's, that's different. You speak the same language more or less. Right. right. Anyway, I really like that book. So what's going on in Dark Tide Rising, which is an interesting title, I think. Sinister, I hope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I think you might find that the, the villain is not entirely unfamiliar to your patterns of thought. I won't say more than that. But his wife is kidnapped, and Monk has to try to get her back. Hmm. So actually, it's Oliver Rathbone that knocks on the door at some ridiculous yes. hour yes. and summons Monk. And the idea is that this very wealthy man whose wife has been kidnapped has to drop the money. And so no. Monk is supposed to go along to protect him. Yes, make sure that it's all right. And they pick at Jacob's Island, which is a very, very sinister slum, which is slowly sinking, sorry about that, slowly sinking into the, into the river. Right. And every high tide, it sort of seems to be a little higher. And there are strange currents and probably horrible things it's about as sinister as you can get. Everything is dripping all the time. And when the tide rises, the lower rooms are submerged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty revolting. Anybody looking at mold today in Phoenix would yes, be yes. horrified. But at the same time, it's a real warren, and so therefore a place where people can easily disappear, you know, or yes. 
Yes. They could get away and so forth. So you already know then when they're going to Jacob's Island that this is just not going to go well, right? Because otherwise they could just meet like at St. Paul's. And, you know, and it would be far more straightforward. So there's a signal there that it's going to go badly. Um, and it does. Um, and I find it intriguing because Oliver Rathbone, um, you know, normally is on the side of right and justice and all that stuff. Um, and eventually, eventually his client winds up in the dock and there's yes. Oliver and Monk. And I thought, I, I can't tell you why it's clever, but it is clever. Uh, and I like the fact that Oliver, um, for once, maybe was holding it at the wrong windmill. Yes, yes. Well, you can't be right all the time. It's not human. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've given him pretty good odds. Come yes. on, he's like at 80-20 <laughs> yes. at least yes. in the books, oh, yes. right? Oh, yes, you want the hero to win, but just have the little hint that he could be fallible. Mm -hmm. And did you enjoy Hooper? I enjoyed them all. Mm -hmm. I'm very fond of the Monksters. Um, you know, I've always liked them. Um, I love the River Police. I think um, if you spend any time in London, I had a very good friend, you remember Catherine Spoils, that had this incredible apartment right on the Thames, right across from the Greenwich Naval College. And you could, on her balcony, you could actually walk under the river in the in the famous tunnel that's there to Greenwich. Um, but if you sat there at night and you watched the shipping going up and down the river and you listened to it because there's, you know, lots of boat noises, right, horns and other stuff. And you realize that London is truly a city whose artery is the river. It really is the river. Yeah, and it starts up, um, up by Oxford, so where I also did a whole summer at one point. Um, so it's a river that um, you can follow. You know, um, if you go to Windsor, you can stand on the bridge looking over the river. The history of the, of the city is in some ways written on the river. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And so I love the idea of the river police, you know, trying to. Um, it's the oldest force we know of, I think. Is it? Just, just about the same time as the French Revolution. Hmm. Also, it actually precedes the Bobbies and the yes. whole, because that's 1831, isn't it, yes. when the police force was established? About then, I don't know. I that. think so. It's Sir Robert Peel, which is who did it, and that's why they're called Bobbies, the yes. tribute to Sir Robert. Yes. I'm pretty sure it's 1831, and it evolved out of the Bow Street Runners, who were. Yes. Um, who are interesting people, and um, they could also work privately. Um, so they were a quasi-official police force. Any of you read those marvelous books by Bruce Alexander? Oh, don't you miss them? I mean, they were so great. Um, and there have been um, people that were, um, I'm trying to remember, were they actually 18th century? I think yes, they were, yes. weren't they? Early, so, uh, mid, I thought they were mid-1700s. Yeah, so they were even before the runners, I think. And then, of course, those of us addicted to the Regency have read volumes about the Bow Street runners. Even Georgia Hare, yeah. my goddess, um, you know, has... I remember being glued to these old shades. Yes, but that's the one in France. There are no Bow Street runners there. Yeah, the, I know. the one I had, and I read it over. Well, I have to say that while well, these old shades is good, the Devil's Cub, it's really, you have to read them together. You, you know what we're talking about. No, probably don't read George in here. The finest, actually, I prefer, you're going to hate me for saying this, I actually prefer her to Jane Austen. Oh, you know, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. But she was also brilliant. Um, for one thing, she had terrific dogs. Remember Ulysses, the flyaway cur? He was a cur with a flyaway ear, and he yeah, wrote next yeah. to Bromeris, Mr. Bromeris on his high perch phaeton all around London, and people gave him treats. And I'm serious. I, I know these books by heart. Obviously. <laughs> yes. yes. But anyway, you can learn about the Bow Street Runners, yes. Should, yes. should you do yes. this. But I didn't realize the River Police getting back on track Just here. Back on time with the French Revolution. Okay. And why, why, yeah. why them? Because, um, well, I wanted something different. Also, they, they were pioneers of an organized state run. It started by two men whose names I don't remember. But uh, the, the crime on the river was almost 100%. There was piracy, open, quite open piracy, right. and tremendous number of um, stuff, numbers of cases of stuff went missing. And they, they developed 
about a 97% appearance rate of, of problems. <laughs> and they cut, cut down on the piracy and all sorts of things that were going the on. Shanghai, they actually, yeah. Shanghai, I bet they did. Oh, yes. But there were river pirates up and down the Thames. So, so, you know, as there are women who work trucker routes today, mm -hmm. sex for money, were there people that, women who worked the river and... I haven't come across it, but it sounds interesting. <laughs> but I mean, we've got other fish to fry at the moment. <laughs> I'm going on with, with the 1930s fellows. I know, but I'm going to force you back to William Monk before. Uh -huh. I really like William Monk. Yeah. And I like Hester a lot, too. Um, they're, the, they're the ones who came to America once. Mm -hmm. You yes. know, which the Pitts, I don't think the Pitts have actually done, but Monk and Hester yeah. came for the Civil War in one memorable yes. volume. Yes. Right. But, um, they're not dead or anything. I, can, I would like to resurrect uh, Hooper and uh, what's it? I think her name is what's it called? Grace but Celia. Okay. Yes, I really like that couple. Mm. They they could have a picture these days. Mm. There's just so true. much that you, you could do. Yes, but if I've only you've had time. I know. Yes, I've I've got to do more with Elena though. Yeah. Okay. I've got to. Um, she, she, in this one, it was mostly Berlin. I must do another one with Italy, and then I've got to do one with Paris. And she's got an American mother, so I could bring her to Washington. Mm -hmm. That's going to take me you know, three or four years to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to pray that we celebrate your next decade's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I some, pray that too. And that we're all alive and well, still doing more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, we were talking at dinner. There's been like 33 pits, I think, and I can't remember how many were you amongst. About yet, 10 less. Okay. That's a huge number of books in two series, and yet you always manage to, to keep them different, you know, and interesting. Well, I never get bored of reading them. I wanted to stop more or less whilst I feel, still felt that way about it. Not when somebody said, well, yeah, it was time, wasn't it? Hmm. And we'll, we'll see. I mean, I'm not going to predict what happens. No, I understand. In my experience, is that authors get invigorated by writing something else and then yes. some fabulous idea occurs to them yes, that works in their old story and back they yes. go. Yes, I mean, it's also depends what my publisher says. I mean, I can't oh, but you're so that. crass. I mean, you're writing for money? Seriously? You're not just writing for us? <laughs> well, can you give me a good excuse why I shouldn't pay taxes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a good, a good excuse why I shouldn't pay taxes. No, I want you to keep your green card. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, yes. we so do I. I want you to do that. Very, very good. I think it's so wonderful that like, that Anne is loving life in Los Angeles. I do. This is a turn in her life I am totally unprepared for. <laughs> I think it's just great. Amazing. I wanted it for a long time, but suddenly I, I thought, this is it now. Because, partly because I've, I've, you know Victoria, you know who I'm speaking of. Yep. Partly because she helped me so much, I wasn't doing it totally on my own. Right. And when you come to a country with nobody coming with you, all your, oh, there's not much of my family anyway, but away from all the people you know and everything you know and a country that may or may not want you, to have one friend you can always rely on is a big, big thing. It is a big thing. Yeah. That lifestyle in Los Angeles is a lot different than life in Port Moling. So. Yes, it is. <laughs> I've been to visit her in Scotland in the, in the little village there, so you know, I, I, in my mind's eye, I find it really a remarkable contrast. Did I tell you about the, the, the conversation that really made me realize I've got to leave. Oh. Um, I was, I, I always dress up when I go to church, and somebody said, oh, you, you look very nice today. I said, well, thank you. You look very well. I said, thank you. And I've got a sod of a picture in the attic. I said, I've got a terrible picture in the attic. What do you mean? I said, you've got a picture of Dorian Gray? Uh, Oscar Wilde? Huh? <laughs> I can't. Mm. Yes. People have never heard of Oscar Wilde. Mm. They really can't live with him forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> those of us who are literary have different standards. <laughs> well, Clearly. Yes, but. You know, no, I agree with you. Have heard of him? Well, well, one would like to think that if one made a little promo like that, that it would be appreciated. Right. So, anyway, 
that's Anne. Um, any of you have questions that you would like to ask? Because we, we can't actually say volumes more about what we're doing here. Yes. When is this 30s novel coming out? I think it'd be about a year from now. Oh, yeah. I think the Daniel Pitt will be next April because that's traditionally when the Pitts have published. And so presumably instead of a month next year, you'll be looking at the 1930s. Yes. Um, I'm writing the third Daniel Pitt at the moment. And when I finish that, I'll write the second and then And I'll write the 18th or whatever it is, Christmas that I live, and then it'll be now again. <laughs> so see, we, we often choose in the fall whether she's going to come over, I mean, it's only an hour, right, from LA, um, in September for the monk or in November for the Christmas novel. So we pick November this year because of, of her birthday, but if she's going to do a 1930s book, would you rather that she came with that in September? Right? Okay. All right. Well. Now we have our answer there. Mm. Right, and then, you know, we'll see about, about Mr. Pitt in April. Yes. So, um, you mentioned that just before you came here, you literally took pen from paper, and I'm curious to know if that is how you write. Do you yes. use pen and paper? Do you have any kind of outline? What is your process? Um, first of all, I would like to have a good idea that the publisher's gonna take another whatever it is. Because I have to plan it long before I actually start writing it. Then I get an idea, we hope. So far that's always worked. I mean, <clears throat> it could, uh, could fail, but <clears throat> then I think of what story background. It, it has to be a certain thing because my contract says one novel, 100,000 words approximately uh, about, I haven't got the contract yet, but I, I believe it says featuring Daniel Pitt and then one novel, approximately 100,000 words, featuring Elena, and then a novel, a novella, approximately 40,000 words of your own choice. And that is a contract and has to be fulfilled. And I think, right, well, I'm going to do a Daniel story. That means it's going to have to concern the law, it's going to have to be set in 1910, because we don't want it to move too quickly towards 1914. What interests me, and um, what would, and in this particular one that I'm working on now, which is the only one I can sort of think of and outline sensibly, I chose the title "Dig Two Graves" because I think the the idea that you can have revenge and come out ahead is a mistake so many of us make. If we're out to destroy somebody else from revenge, we're, we're going to destroy a good part of ourselves anyway. And then I thought, what sort of person would be interesting to work with? So I, I imagined a, a person, taken from the real life historical person about that time, roughly. And then what is going to be the forensic background, because that's what we're dealing in, legal and forensics. And then think of a story, and think of, I, I need my forensic expert to have made a mistake and they hardly ever do. So there's a lot of research goes into what could be an understandable mistake that would matter. Mm. And I found one with the help of my brother. Yeah. Well, he's, he's a doctor. I know, he's a doctor, that's right. And uh, then I constructed a story around that about how the mistake would be not recognized and what would be the results of it, and how the rivalry works out between the doctor and partly Daniel and partly other people as well. And I'm just working out what the trial will be like. There are, I believe, about three trials in this story. One, Daniel gets suckered into doing something that is, well, he, he gets pulled into defending somebody that actually turns out to be guilty, and he realizes this part of the way through. And there are lots of lovely grisly problems because of that. And I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to finish. I know I'm going to finish at the end of the final trial because if you think about how much weight goes on forensic evidence, and this is just the beginning of forensic evidence being important in trials, and a lot of people find it very difficult to understand at that time because we're used to it and they're not. And you have to convince the jury who doesn't want to know of something that, that 
happened. And when you upset people's beliefs by proving that somebody they trust made a mistake, mm -hmm. people are very unwilling to believe that. Mm -hmm. Because if you think that your doctor made a mistake, I mean, that's a very serious thing. That's life and death, and it could be your life and death. So it would be much more comfortable to believe that these people, these lawyers here are wrong than that the doctor's right. Um, the turn of the century presents all sorts of interesting, difficult, challenging things, and it seems to happen at the turn of every century, mm -hmm. as far back as I know. Yep, mm -hmm. I agree entirely. It's all okay, chaos. Yes. Yep. Uh, particularly to take the 1700s into the 1800s. And the 18 into the 1900s, we lost Victoria, but the whole world shifted. I and mean, when the big shift came in 1914, but that's not so big. We're more than that far into this new century ourselves. New ideas, lots of them, disturbing, different, things are challenged. And with Victoria dead, there was a tremendous social shift. Um, and when people are challenged, it, it it's very interesting what people what they will accept and what they won't, and what excuses they will find not to accept a challenge mm. to, the, to the values they hold. And that's applicable to any time. I mean, we're going through something like that here, and it, it, it shows signs of people you didn't know existed, and you <coughs> signs of yourself you didn't know. And do you accept change or not? Some people accept it without looking at it and discover it pretty bad when they get there. Other people won't accept it even when it's forced down their and it can divide families, it can divide you against yourself. You can discover things about people that are a big surprise. Which is fun. That's what stories are all about. Discovering things in yourself and in other people. And how do you react to change? The new ideas that challenge what you believed. I mean, I believe, from a friend of mine who told me, that there are people in the neighborhood in which she lives, and I'm talking about the United States, that actually believe the Earth is flat. Exactly. I mean, if somebody says that to you, what do you answer? Well, you asked me that before, and I still don't have an answer. I have no idea what you would say if somebody seriously said they thought the earth was flat. Yes, but people, mm -hmm. people do have some very strange ideas, and their whole concept of who they are and what is right and wrong, their place in society, God, if, they, if there is one, if you challenge that, you're likely to make an enemy for life. Some people Oh, that's a new idea, how exciting. But you're blaspheming, you're threatening the order of things. And they can become very dangerous. So it's a, it's a wonderful period to write about. Mm. And you're just coming into the age of, of, of um, psychotherapy. That's right, in Vienna, which, you know, Vienna's having its last mm -hmm. golden burst before World yes. War One, when it all goes downhill from there, yes. right. But, um, there was a lot of, of great stuff happening, including psychotherapy. I was just there. And, you know, you can see Klimt and Shuey paintings, and you can see Freud, and, um, you know, there's a big thing in furniture, the whole Biedermeyer thing, and, you know, lots of exciting art. Um, it, was a, it was a tremendous sort of last flowering of the Habsburg Empire. And then, of course, we get the war in 1914, and that hastens change of all sorts, especially social right. change. It and certainly destroyed Vienna. Yeah. Yes, and women are never the same again after that. Right. People do all sorts of things, and when the men come home, they want their jobs back. And sorry, they but I can do this now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's and people didn't want to work in service. They didn't want to be working in homes. So that whole economic engine of big houses and people working in them largely went away. Well, it, it began to go away in favor of people having salary jobs and living in their own accommodations. Yeah. Which sometimes was not anything about as comfortable as what they get. No. It was but change is the biggest threat to character and the biggest revealer of what we really believe and why. Which is why it's so, it's so much fun to write about change. <laughs> well, I mean, stories are built on conflict. Yeah. And so, you know, that's what you're talking about. The change is an engine for conflict and the conflict is one. Between which creates crimes and, you know, all the things that go into your books. You sort of, uh, you sort of find you have to sort out what you believe and why, and how much of what you believe is based upon what you need to believe rather than what you actually would believe if you thought that. So how many trials 
at the Old Bailey or elsewhere, how many trials have you attended? Because you, you, you write about trials a formidable number, right? Haven't actually been to any? No, I, uh, I have to read about the law and what it is, but I, it, it always makes me a bit nervous. I've had some lawyers come to let me in my trials, and I think, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> but I think trial is one of the oldest measures of, of, of our belief. The ancient Egyptians believed that you tried and your soul was weighed when you were dead as to whether you'd go up or down. There's something fascinating about seeking the truth and it's dangerous. And the combat, I mean, in, in Britain in 1000 on, on a little bit, it, it was trial by combat. You picked your champion. Right. And if they won, you're innocent. And if they, if they lost, you're guilty. I mean, facts have nothing to do with it. Well, it was an adversarial system, and yes. it's still an adversarial system. And the yes, okay. thesis is that out of that adversarial conflict, the truth arises, but sadly, it often, <laughs> often doesn't. Like well, the O.J. Simpson case, which was, you know, just a classic of the whole thing misfiring. Oh, we've had our turn of that, too. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? The drama draws us. It always does to me. Yeah. And the trying to, to get the truth out. I mean, Perry Mason did the run for generations. Mary Mason never actually had a trial that any court would have allowed. <laughs> His, trust me, Earl Stanley Gardner as a lawyer should have been ashamed of himself, but he actually knew how to write books that people wanted to read. Yeah. Probably, yeah, as he was counting the money, he thought of occasionally. Because they're still showing. <laughs> yes, that's true. But it, it's, it's the idea that there's going to be a, a final test and we're going to learn the real truth about something. Justice is going to be done. How often it is, I don't know, but it's, it's getting more complex and the morality is getting a little more shaded in uh, the this term for the new century, I have to use it. Right. As we, but I know you know a lot more about the law than I do, which isn't difficult to know a lot about it. Well, I've been to trials with yes. the old Bailey, and they're, they're actually not that different than, than ones you read about. And often they're extremely right. boring. Yes, I know. I mean, trials I'll can be that. really tedious, <laughs> which is yes. When, when you're writing it for um, for a publication, you have to really ask about the context, you know, what would actually happen. Yes. But it's um, it's fun, and I hope that the I don't. I mean, I haven't had people point out mistakes in the book. I do try to go through past many people, but most of it's not about them. It's about human. Anyone else have a question? Yes. Well, I vote for Monk. <laughs> and um, when you're, you, you talked about you've got three books kind of in contract. Yes. Do they give you amount of time that you have to at least? Yes. yes. They give you a day by which you must have a third day. Huh. Yes. If you want to get paid, yes. <laughs> you have deadlines, they're gone. And the truth is, you know what, that lots of authors would actually never publish their books if they did not have deadlines. Um, you can go on forever hoping to make your book better. And one of the arts of being published is to, is to let it go. Even if it's not perfect, even if it's not, you know, at some point. Mine are never perfect, but if the due date comes, if I want to read it, I'd imagine sort of Well, but my point is that being a published writer and, you know, a person who isn't a published writer very often comes down to that, that of being willing to let your book go, you know, and, and be published. Um, no argument here for that. It's absolutely true. But I'm listening. I never had one. I thought it was oh. It's perfect before I begin. Because I right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question about your, after the 1930s, if you had said this before, I don't remember. The protagonist that is a woman and yes. she's like what rank or uh, whatever where she, she lives in England? Is she middle class or upper? Or, uh, um, do you tell us anything about that? Upper middle class, I think. Uh, she's she's 27. She has an older sister who was widowed in the last week of the war. Same week she was married. She was she was a single woman, a, a, a married woman. It happened to quite a few people. Mm. Uh, the thing is, which we do know at the beginning, her grandfather was head of MI6 during World War I. She doesn't know that. And it may seem to you that it's unlikely that his whole family wouldn't know, but they really didn't. And it wasn't made public that there even was an MI6 
it's from 1995. Mm -hmm. And my own father, on whom my grandfather was built as a personality, did lots of work during the war that I've only learned of in the last few years. Mm -hmm. He's been gone for quite a while. It, it wasn't MI6, but it, um, it was Yeah, I don't think we ever answered your question. One of the questions she wanted to know was, do you, do you write by longhand? Oh, yes, by hand. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Like a legal yeah. pad, lined paper? Yes, oh, yeah. Le uh, lined, fine lined legal paper. Mm -hmm. and, and is it transformed into something before it goes to the publisher? Oh, yes, I have to, I, I have no. to um, um, dictate it to somebody because nobody else can read my writing. I can't really read it myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a good idea what I wrote. <laughs> what I would like to do. Right. Yeah. So you have a secretary, essentially, or a, transcri I did, yeah, a transcription? I didn't, bring, I didn't bring her with me. Oh, you left her back and... Yeah, well, actually, she retired anyway, yes. Okay. She's my age. Oh, well, there you are. So how do you do it now? Do you have a, a professional typist who comes in? No, um, I send it to Victoria. I tape it and send it to Victoria. Oh, She's yeah. typed much more rapidly than I do. I see. And more accurately than I do, too. Um, and she's a good editor halfway, you know, she is a professional mm -hmm. editor. Um, it doesn't take her anything like the time. She she can type at roughly the speed at which I speak, if I'm speaking at all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's only part of what she does. <laughs> it's not that hard when you, when you are serious. <laughs> yeah. I, I can actually type faster than I can type. <laughs> can, can you? Yeah, I you really can. You don't talk slowly. No, 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 I really can. <laughs> Um, so can I, but it's not accurate. <laughs> it looks like hell, I think. Um, well, on that theme, then, what pen do you use? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to give her a Mont Blanc right now? It's a birthday present. Uh, oh. Unless there are packages of four from Staples, I don't know. You're utilitarian, I see. Packages of four. Okay. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That's pentax. Yeah. Gel pens? Yes, oh, gel pens. Yes, I have a bunch of those in every color. <laughs> but uh, on, on only, only the Pantel and not, not another sort. I've tried different ones. And uh, what, what you don't have here that I've been able to find is a box of refills. You just have to buy the whole pen each time. Yeah. I think that's true now. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that refills, that used to be available, but I think now the pens are so inexpensive to manufacture so that you just lot less expensive buy a pen. Than the, uh, I have my brother send me 12 boxes of 12 each, 144 at a time. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of number I use. Mm -hmm. Red, black, and purple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yes, well I, 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 I have a <laughs> Yes, I use black, black, blue, and purple, and red occasionally. Mm -hmm. I understand that schools are now beginning to teach penmanship again. Would be a really, really good thing. I've always had dreadful handwriting because I, my hand can't keep up with my head or my mouth. I can type that fast, but I can't write that fast. So I have the same problem you do. I very often have no idea what I actually wrote when I'm all done. Oh, yes, I suppose that the writing is so, it tries to keep up with my thinking. And I can't type naturally. I yeah. write naturally. I don't have to think about squiggle, oh. squiggle, squiggle. It looks as if an army of centipedes has got trouble. <laughs> and Robbie looks like the kind of script they have in Georgia. When Rob and I stopped in Georgia in Tbilisi, no, it wasn't Tbilisi, it was Batumi. It all looks like spaghetti. It's really fascinating. You see the sign, and there's this kind of line that looks like a noodle, you know, but it's actually, and, and we haven't figured out. I mean, the only way I can work out that you can do that is that it would be more like, like a painting. I mean, you, you couldn't actually write it, you know, the way you write letters. It's not, yeah. it's not well, mine an tends alphabet. To look, mine tends to look a bit like that when I'm really on a roll. But I've usually got an idea what I'm likely to have said. The times when I think, well, no, I don't speak that way. Mm. That isn't what it means. It means something else. Well, so you have an extra challenge, yes. right? <laughs> what did I actually write, she says, looking back later. Do you do you read what Victoria sends back to you then and correct it? Well, she's usually got it right at the first well, place. Well, if, if, if neither of you can read what you wrote, if you well, can't she, read it and you dictated it strangely, how can she do that? Well, I have to dictate it so that it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, that's my fault. So you edited it when you dictated it? Yes. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Then. Well, All right. I'm a uh, doesn't come out very well. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? Um, how long does the whole process take? Uh, 
process take from, you know, setting pen to paper to all the way to editing and, and print? Well, I don't do all of that. I, I write it and I read it and have it transcribed and rewrite it and rewrite it again, which it mustn't take more than about four months. But then, I, then what the what the publisher does with it can take a year after that, and that's not my problem. <laughs> because they, they have to do all sorts of things like um, I don't think they do typeset anymore, do they? Do all sorts of other things. But they have to place it in their list. I mean, I think Bertelsmann is the biggest publisher in the world now. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's Random House is part of Bertelsmann. So you know, I'm a middle-sized pebble in a very very large pond. And it takes them about a, a year to, from receiving the finished manuscript to putting it in the slot because they do go to some trouble to, to get it advertised and you know placed and so forth. And they need that much work up time with a tremendous amount of books that they have to know what, exactly what they're going to do where. And they need to co do cover design and blurbs. And books used to come to press faster when mm. publishers were mm. smaller. Um, and the delay is often just has to do with the sheer volume in the you know, in the track. It isn't that the author didn't write it faster, or that even the production now is extremely simple. I mean, you know, it's done electronically, but you do have to decide on a format. But I've, I've said this before, and many of you know this: the author owns the copyright to the to the words, to the content, but the publisher owns the copyright to the whole design of the book and the jacket art, and sometimes it's done in-house, sometimes they commission art from artists, and the artist then owns the art but licenses it to the publisher, so it's a really complicated um, process, and that's why the books look different like country to country, and sometimes the paperback looks different than the hardcover because there's a different design. What gets um, me is when they give it a different title. Uh -huh. like, when you, you mean country to country? Yeah. yeah, sometimes that's very true. The UK titles are often not the US titles, and God only knows what like the Russian or Georgian title mm -hmm. would yes, turn out to be. It would be in Russian or Georgian. Yes. If it's the English language, I can't find such and such a book. Well, actually, yes, you can. It's just called something different where you live. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, you've had some titles yes. like that, right? Mm -hmm. In our system, there are some books by Anne that, you know, I know that the US title was is different than the UK title, but sometimes we get people asking us why they can't read your well, book so and so, and the answer is that you know it is you can, you can. It's just not that's not what it's called. It, it, it's a mistake we're going to try very hard not to have again. No. No. Which is why they have to have conferences as to what they're going to call something, and it's very often something different from what I called it. Thank goodness they kept um, Dark Tide Rising. Yes, which I, I really like that as the title. I, I like it's it too. perfect for a month, fight, I think. Fight for it. Yeah. But we're having a terrible problem of what they're going to call the Elena. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they've settled on, it's either death in focus or focus on death. Something like that, anyway. Okay. None of which I thought of. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, which of your books you think might be adapted well to um, movies, and if that's a, a possibility, we're working on it. Oh, you are. Yes. Yeah, we're good. Bits, all of them. But we're working on it. It's it's a, a work in hope and, and progress. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's many more opportunities now with all the streaming and serial television and so forth. So there are lots more books being being filmed um, in one way or another than there used to be, which is really very exciting. So it's better to be in L.A. now than it would be in London because of the movie aspect no, of it? No, actually, the TV, a lot of it is done more in Britain. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, Anne has a foot in each camp, so no, that's a good thing. Yeah, but I didn't live in London. I lived in Scotland. Oh, okay. And it's definitely better almost anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when they've never heard of Oscar Wilde, they've never heard of Oscar Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> back to Oscar Wilde. <laughs> well, he was Irish. <laughs> He uh, was, that's <laughs> absolutely true. I know Irish. <laughs> well, Dublin, Dublin's quite a good place to be for getting something done. But he was yes. Anglo Irish, so he spent all his time. One more question for you? Uh, just a statement. I would just like to say that I'm an English teacher and I have taught Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. So I've done my. Let's hear it for Oscar, who somehow got into this discussion, right? <laughs> you 
he's a wonderful writer, as a matter of fact. You know, it's a shame that his personal story kind of got in the way of, of his letter. No, but it did then. Well, he should have said, get away with it, don't fortune. Yes, sometimes, yes, it was a told at windmill, sort of like David Cameron thinking he should call for a Brexit vote. You know, sometimes people do amazingly stupid things, and you think, why did he do that? I know. No, Oscar should have just let it go. Oh. Well, uh, apart from being witty, it should have, you know, because he was, one of my favorite sayings was not, I think it was Whistler, actually, when somebody said something really funny, and Oscar said, I wish I'd thought of that, I wish I'd said that, Whistler said, never mind, dear, you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, very nice. Yes, ma'am. I was, I was thinking of one question to ask, and okay. the question was, why did you put Monk on the river? And I think you answered that by saying you wanted something different for him. So I've been yes. racking my brain for another question that sounded maybe intelligent. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but one, the, the question I came up with, my second question was, you started out with the, the, um, um, Thomas Pitt, yes. and then you went to Monk, you know, after many stories. What made you jump to that new character and develop because that Because I was suddenly series? able to sell two books a year instead of one. You get very tired of writing one set of pieces. Life's bigger than that. But uh, I also moved publishers, and they would, they would take two. Uh, mm. I was with a publisher, better not be named, and uh, we they they would mm. they paid me an enormous sum, I think three and a half thousand dollars for the book, and uh, then they had the option on the next one. They would never commission it in advance. The option within two months. And I was getting very fed up with them. And it wasn't that they didn't pay very much. It was that they wouldn't have a kind word for it. That doesn't cost anything to say, yes, I like your work. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, we got an offer two months to the day after. So it was the day their offer expired. We got a different offer. We said, yes. And when they came back a few days later, I think we'll have it. But you know, I think you won't. I think we will. No, not. We will. We won't. <laughs> and this publisher treats me very, very, very well. Mm. Well, there you are. She had more stories to tell, and the income was not unwelcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was bread and butter and cheese instead of bread and cheese. It is. You know, there's, it's a really interesting thing, having been talking to authors for 30 years. Some people really struggle to write a book every 10 years, think about it, yeah. Donna Tartt, Thomas Harris, my God, he's gonna have a new book, it's been like 10 years. Mm -hmm. Some people only write one book, like To Kill a Mockingbird or Gone with the Wind or something. Some people could do a book a year, but that could be very difficult for them. And then there are people like Ian who can actually write. Has more ideas. Yeah, um, you know, not, not, writers are not all the same, and some of them are naturally more productive than others. Yeah. Um, there are sort of two things to that. One, I must say, many of the writers who write only one book, they do have another skill. I don't really have any other skills, but that's all I do. I'm not aware that there were a lot of other skills <laughs> on the table for a couple of that I had mentioned. Well, maybe not those, but right. quite, quite a few people do have other skills. Or they have, they have other things in life they're doing, and yes. either they have a story, sometimes People have a story they want to tell, but their life's work is actually something else. Yeah. But I feel time, time's winged chariot hurrieth near, mm -hmm. and I've got such a lot I want to explore. Mm -hmm. I, I do really enjoy picking up stories. Yeah, you do, but that's my point, yeah. is that you really like picking up stories, and yes, yeah, so for you, it's easier to write many books, yes, you know, where some people really have to labor to write a book. So, um, I know you've been sitting a long time, and even bolstered by cake, you're probably getting wiggly in your chair. So, let me thank our Facebook audience for joining us. Um,